Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solids here, and once again, in collaboration with Chip Theory Games, I'm here to do a Gearlock guide. And today's guide is going to focus on Figment. He is one of the Gearlocks who is in the new Unbreakable expansion box, so I'm super happy to show him to you, and he is really, really cool. So Figment is a time traveler who is hundreds of years old. He's in possession of a time machine and the time machine is gonna let him manipulate a lot of things having to do with initiative and the round tracker. He's just got a lot of really interesting strategic value that I'm going to show you. So as we get started, I've got all of Figment's stuff ready to go. Here's his gear lock mat with his chip. This is a phase chip, which I'm gonna talk about later. We've got his dice, including his initiative die, which we're gonna be using a lot this video actually in demos. Uh, we have his gear lock reference sheet, and we've also got the lovely new Unbreakable Battle Mat. And this time I've got the Bridge Troll, who's one of the enemies from Unbreakable. And I resurrected my trusty Troll Youngin from all these previous videos, but I've got two of them because Figment does a lot of stuff with turn order, and I want to make sure that I can show you everything that I need to in our examples. So Figment looks pretty much like a normal gear lock. He's got his stats up here, his professions. He's a ranged fighter, so he's gonna come onto the battle mat in one of the ranged positions of his choice. And he's got very interesting innate abilities. So his innate ability is called Time Adept, and his innate plus one is called Time Lord. And a lot of times a gearlock will have an innate ability that involves them starting with dice on their mat, uh, but actually Figment doesn't start with any dice on his mat. He's going to have to train them all, but they're going to be really cool once he gets there. However, his innate ability, Time Adept, is extremely useful. I'm going to demonstrate it right now. So let's say that we're getting all set up for battle and we're setting up our batty Q and our initiative meter. So our little bridge troll over here is going to have an initial initiative two. Our Troll Youngin has an initiative of three. And you know, that looks pretty encouraging, but let's say that Figment has a really, really bad roll and he gets a one. So the first thing that Figment can do with his innate ability before battle even starts is just choose to reroll this initiative die. So he does not have to live with this. So we can just reroll it. Oh, wow, amazing. Figment got a four. Awesome. So Figment can just re-roll his die as part of his innate ability. And the other thing that he can choose to do in addition to rolling his die, so it's not either or, it's both and, um, is Figment can move himself up or down the initiative meter by one. So that means that Figment could choose for one reason or another, you'll see some you know possible reasons, to move himself down the initiative meter by one. Uh, or if this was where he had somehow started, he could move up by one. So basically Figment before battle even starts has the ability to kind of position himself and strategize about where he's going to be. Um, and when he gets an eight plus one, he can actually also do that for himself and then a little bit of help for someone else. So his innate ability time adapt lets him reroll his own initiative die and then move himself up or down one position. His innate plus one time Lord allows him to not only do both of those things for himself, but also to choose one ally or one baddie and move them up or down one space on the initiative from their original position. So that means that he can make one of his allies go earlier. He can make a baddie go later. He can choose to make a baddie go earlier because he, there's a reason maybe that he would want that, but he is able to manipulate time. And that, as you're gonna see, is something that's gonna become extremely handy, especially as he starts to train these skill dice, which are gonna be awesome. So with that said, if you wanna follow along with me, uh, we are gonna talk first about Figment's first profession, which is called Time Skipper. So this first die is called Time Jump. Let's have a good look at it. All right, so given the game that we're playing, you knew there was gonna be at least one bones face. Time Jump does have a bones face on it, but all of the other faces are an image of a pocket watch with a different number. And the number is either gonna be one or two. And what that watch indicates is time jump. When you time jump, that means you're taking a baddie's initiative die that's either directly before or after yours in the initiative meter. You can move this die to the top of the initiative meter and then deal that number of damage to that baddie. So let's go ahead and see it in action. So let's say that Figment has rolled a two on his time jump die and that this is the current initiative positions. What Figment has the ability to do is move the baddie who's immediately beneath him up above him to the top of the queue and then do two damage to that baddie because it says two 
on the die. So that's a little bit of damage done. Figment doesn't have to be anywhere near him. After all, he is ranged. So that is time jump. Now let's go ahead and take a look at schism. So again, as expected, schism does have a bones face. However, all of its other faces have this schism symbol and then either a one or two. And what schism lets you do is deal the number printed on the die worth of damage to all baddies above you in the initiative meter. So in this current setup, Figment is last in the initiative, which would mean that if he rolled this result, he could do two damage to each of these baddies because they're both above him in the initiative meter. So there are also times when you just want to be polite and let other people go first so that you can hurt them with schism. So that's the schism die. The next die in this profession we're going to talk about is die number three, which is called warp. And again, this one's got a bones face, but then all of the other faces are a little sand timer with either value one, two, or three printed up here in the top right corner. And what warp lets you do is increase or decrease the round counter by up to the number printed on the die. So yes, that means that I could be here in round one and I could make it round two or three with the two result that I rolled on this die. Or if I was already in round three, I would have the option to go up to rounds four or five or down to rounds two or one. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what round it is. And that is warp. The fourth die in this profession is called waypoint and you need warp in order to get it. Once again, we have a lovely little bones face, but every other face shows the waypoint skill uh, with the value in the top right of one, two, or three. And what the waypoint lets you do is move your initiative die down by a maximum of this number of spots in the initiative meter. And then turn order actually continues from your new initiative spot. So let's say that Figment is actually at the top of the initiative meter and he rolls this die result. He would have the option to move down the initiative meter up to two spaces, but maybe what I wanna do is just go down one. And that will effectively skip one of the baddies turns this round and maybe I think I'm gonna get some kind of advantage from that. This skill gets even better when you're playing in co-op because it lets you have a lot of say about which of the gear locks are going to come up first or gonna come up sooner than expected. So that is waypoint. And then the last die in this profession is called borrowed time. So once again, as expected, you have a bones face. And then you have this borrowed time hourglass symbol on all the other faces with a printed value of somewhere between one and three. What borrowed time allows you to do is place up to the number on the die of exhausted skill dice from the time skipper profession, not including this one, into your backup plan on their bones side. So let's say that I've been really into my time skipper profession. I've rolled these two dice already, and then on a future turn, I rolled this die. Uh, if these have been sitting here exhausted, I can use the power on this die to exhaust this die. You know, it doesn't get to go in, but these two dice can become bones on the backup plan. And there are other reasons why I might want them there, which I will show you later in the video. So that is how borrowed time works. So we'll put our dice back. And that is the time skipper profession. So now we're going to look at profession number two, that is staff wielder. And we can just train any of these abilities right off the hop. They're all starred. So let's find out what they do. So the first thing I want to say about all these different abilities is they are locked slot dice. As you can see, there are only three lock slots on Figment's mat. And so there are a bunch of dice that could go in those slots. And you're going to have to make some decisions about what you want, what skills you want them to have, what skills you want them to maintain. But let's go ahead and look at Chrono Trigger. That sounds familiar to all you retro gamers out there, although it's hard to believe that's a retro game now. Okay, so there are actually no bones on this die at all. There are faces that have values two, three, four, and five. And what these numbers actually stand for is the round in which the die will exhaust. So what Chrono Trigger does is as long as it's in a lock slot, at the start of each round, you deal one damage to the weakest baddie. However, uh, let's say that we roll this die at the beginning of battle and it's round three, and then it becomes round four, that means that in round four, we're not just going to do what we'd been doing before, which is one damage to the weakest baddie. Instead, when the round die matches the round number that's on the dice, then you exhaust this die and you deal damage to any baddie that you want that's equal to half of the round number rounded up. So in round four, I would have to exhaust this die, but I could do two damage to any baddie that I wanted anywhere on the battle mat. So what makes this interesting is that if I put this die up here with a four on it, given that I also have my time skipper abilities... I could put myself in a situation where it's just really never round four and I can continue to use the ability on this die indefinitely until a round four actually occurs. 
because don't forget, some of these dice allow me to change what round number it is. So what makes these dice interesting is that they have a decent ability while they're locked. They have a more powerful ability in the round that matches their number, but you have to exhaust them. So you have to choose if you want to end up exhausting that die and just let time take its course, or if you want to manipulate what time it is, what round it is, so you can keep taking advantage of that die's ability. So that is Chrono Trigger. So let's go ahead and take a look at Chrono Buffer, which works very similarly. So Chrono Buffer, again, is going to have values from 2 through 5, representing rounds 2, 3, 4, and 5. And basically at the start of each round, you're going to grant one buff HP to the weakest gear lock. However, if the round number matches the number on the die, then you exhaust this die and you're going to give the number of buff HP to any gear lock that equals half of the round number rounded up. So this round five, if I exhausted it, would let me give three buff HP to any gear lock I wanted. But once I allowed that to happen, the die would exhaust. So I could choose never to let it become round five, if at all possible. And instead, I could just give one buff HP to the weakest gear lock indefinitely for as long as it's in a lock slot. So that is Chrono Buffer. And then the last skill in this profession is called Chrono Seer. And here we see Figment's cool staff. And again, the die faces are going to be numbers two, three, four, and five, representing rounds two, three, four, and five. And this goes in a locked slot. So as long as the round does not match the number on that die, at the start of each of those rounds, you give a bones to the weakest gear lock. However, if it is the round that matches this number, instead you're going to exhaust this die and you're going to give a number of bones to any gear lock that's equal to half of the round rounded up. So when this exhausts in round three, you're going to end up giving two bones to any gear lock that you want, but you lose the die from your lock slot. Alternatively, you can make sure it's never round three, and then you can just give a bonus to the weakest gear lock every time for as long as it's there. So that is Chrono Seer. And this is overall a super interesting profession because it gives more meaning to the round manipulation that you can do with Time Skipper. And it also gives you choices about the real estate up here in your lock slots because these do really cool things, but you're going to have to decide, do I want to let it exhaust in the course of time so I can get that better ability that one time? And you also have to ask yourself, are these the locked dice I really want up here? Because as, you can, as you're about to see, there are even more locked dice and they're all cool. So that brings us to Figment's next profession, which is called theoretician. So the theoretician profession is interesting because it has some of the same, like what round is it characteristics of the staff wielder dice, but you do have a little bit more flexibility and control, which again means that you're gonna be even more conflicted about what you want in your lock slots because there's gonna be so many options. So the first die in this profession is called Temporal Disorienter, and it's die number nine. And this die is going to have two different numbers on it. So three of its sides are going to have the numbers two and four, a white two and a blue four. And the other half of its sides are going to feature a white three and a blue five. And each of these numbers does something different. So Temporal Disorienter is a locked slot die. So you put up there in that locked slot. And basically at the end of your turn in round three, which is printed in white, and round five, which is printed in blue, you may stun a one point baddie. However, when you hit round five, the blue number, you have an extra ability that if you use it will cause you to exhaust the die. So in round three and five, you can just go ahead and stun a one point baddie. No problem. The die just stays in the lock slot. You can keep using this ability forever. But in round five, the blue number, you could additionally choose to exhaust this die to stun a five point or less baddie. So basically, you always get the base abilities on the dice. But that blue number, when the round number matches the blue number, you can exhaust the die and do something that gives you a little bit more bang for your buck. But you do have to exhaust the die. So you have to choose, oh, am I good with a one point baddie or do I also want a five point baddie to be stunned this round? And for those of you who are new to the game, uh, there is a lovely baddie skills reference that you're going to want to look at. Stunning is pretty darn good. When you place the stun effect die on a target, the target loses its next turn. So sometimes it's really going to be worth it to exhaust that die. So that is Temporal Disorienter. The next die in this profession is called Temporal Rectifier, and it works basically the same way. So once again, you're going to have these die faces with two numbers. You're going to have half the die faces have a white two and a blue four, and the other half are going to have a white three and a blue five. But what this symbol means is that at the end of your turn in rounds two and four or rounds three and five, if it's the other face, you may heal any gear lock for one HP. 
But if you're in the blue number round, you can additionally, so on top of what you already get to do, exhaust this die to heal any gear lock for three HP. So you might just want to keep this in your lock slot forever and get kind of like a base amount of healing. Or maybe you really need to heal up and you're just going to burn this die when you get to that blue round number because you really, really want that three HP. And of course, don't forget, Figment also has the ability to manipulate what round it is. So he can keep making it be round two or keep making it be round four and get those benefits extra times because he doesn't have to wait for the rounds to just take by. He can do something about it, whether that round naturally gets there or not. So that is Temporal Rectifier. Then we've also got Temporal Splitter. And again, same basic function as the other two dice in this profession. So you're gonna have some faces that have a white two and a blue four, and some die faces that have a white three and a blue five. But when you are in the rounds printed on the die, you can place a weaken one effect die on any baddie. So just to have a look, weaken is right down here at the bottom. So you can place a weaken one effect die on a target, and that means that that unit's attack stat die is gonna get reduced by one. So you can do a lot of weakening by one, but if you get into round five and you want to exhaust this die, because that's a blue number, then you can choose on top of placing all the little weaken dice to additionally exhaust this die to place a disable effect die on a five point or less baddie. And what disable does is suspend the unit's skills. Uh, and so you can kind of take a break from somebody's poison or something else that you really hate uh, for a turn, which is great. So that is Temporal Splitter. And again, this profession is interesting because you benefit from it being a specific round and Figment has the ability to manipulate what round it is. So you don't just have to wait until round three or until round five. You can be messing around with what round it is and benefit from these dice multiple times while they're in your lock slots in any given battle. It can be round three more than once if you are handling your dice right. So that is the theoretician profession. We also have this awesome profession over here uh, called Phantom. And basically, Figment is able to do something very cool. So because he kind of travels through time and he's been in different dimensions, he can summon these, I guess, creatures, beings that are called phases. And what the phases do is they appear for him on the battle mat. They can't attack because they're not really there, uh, but they also don't suffer from status effects. So what they do is they have HP and they kind of act as like a dummy for the baddies to come and attack. Um, and it takes some of the pressure off of Figment. So let's have a look at the first die in that profession, which is called Phase Ghost. So of course, Phase Ghost has one bones result. But it's also got all these little images of a phase with one HP because it doesn't summon a very strong phase, but it does summon one. And I'm going to show you how it works. So let's say that we've rolled a phase ghost result. So let's say that Figment is here, but he doesn't want to be here. He wants to be somewhere else. I can put my little phase ghost right here because you can place it in any available position on the battle mat. And then Figment immediately swaps positions with the phase. So Figment can get away from the scene if something is going a little bit crazy or you can just put a dummy in there to make room for him to have a little bit more tempo in a battle. So the phase doesn't stay forever, but it's pretty handy. So there are two ways to get rid of a phase. One is that it can lose its HP. So it's only got one. What's going to happen is that this troll young and it's going to hit it next time instead of going after figment because it's there, which is pretty convenient. So once it's out of HP, it will just disappear. Or it'll just happen naturally because you exhaust this die at the start of your next turn. So phases don't get to stay forever, but they do provide a very welcome distraction on your one turn while they're there. So that is phase ghost. And phase ghost upgrades to something very cool called phase wraith. So there's a slightly clearer phase on this side of the chip. And let's have a look at it. So once again, you can roll a bones, but let's hope that you don't because these phases are much more powerful. So you can roll a phase that has six HP, a phase that has five HP, or even if you're very lucky, a phase that has eight HP. And once again, it doesn't stick around forever. It's still gonna automatically be removed from the battle mat at the start of your next turn when you have to exhaust the die. However, you can keep it around a little bit longer if you just make sure that your turn doesn't start right away. <laughs> so you also have the chance to buy yourself um, some time with these phases. They act as little dummies for the baddies to go after. 
uh, because you can place them where you were. And that's really nice if they were set up to put a hurting on you. So that is phase race. So I should note that even though you can train both of these phase dice, uh, there can never be more than one phase present on the board at a time. So that's why there's only one phase chip. So no, you cannot have two phases. You can only have one, but hey, they're still pretty darn good. All right, and now we are almost there. Let's go ahead and talk about Figment's consumables, and then we'll be ready to go into the backup plan. So Figment's first consumable is called Kobold Claw. And we should note immediately that a couple of the faces on this die are red bones. So just regular black line bones you may use in your backup plan. If you have red bones where it's filled in with red, you must use it in your backup plan. So when you're trying to roll this consumable, if you roll this result, you can't ignore it. This die then has to go in your backup plan. However, you might also get one of these other faces. Uh, they can be value two or if you roll very high, three. But what Kobold Claw lets you do is deal the number on the die of true damage to any baddie who is before you on the initiative meter. So if you've been politely letting baddies go before you, uh, then you can roll this consumable to do extra damage to anybody who has already taken a turn before you get to yours. So that is Kobold Claw. Continuing with the Kobold theme, we have Kobold Eye. And so Kobold Eye also has a couple of red bones faces. Um, there's actually one that has two red bones on it. It can be used immediately or it can go in one active or locked slot. And it lets you go to your locked slots and exhaust up to two staff wielder or theoretician profession dice that are up there. And then you can resolve them uh, as if the current round number matches the white or blue number on the dice. So basically you have to exhaust those dice, but you can use multiple locked dice effects right away as if it's the round where they get triggered. So there may be a time tempo wise where this comes in very handy. So that is Kobold Eye. And then you get Flash Rewind. So again, you get some of these lovely red bone faces. So Flash Rewind can be used immediately or it can be put in a lock slot, either yours or one of your allies. So this allows you to revive a gear lock who has been KO'd. So if you use it for its immediate function, you can just revive one of your friends who's been knocked out. However, if it's in your lock slot or in a gear lock's locked slot, then it automatically triggers if that gear lock would be KO'd. So basically if you revive someone, their HP goes to the number that's printed on the die. And if you would be KO'd, but this is in your lock slot, instead you automatically prevent the KO and set your HP to the number on the die. So this is a great way, especially if you're playing solo, to prevent yourself from dying because there's nobody to revive you, uh, but you do have a way to kind of plan to revive yourself. And that is Flash Rewind. So now we've covered all of Figment's dice, and it's time to talk about his backup plan. As usual, Figment's backup plan is on the back of his gearlock reference sheet, so you can absolutely read along with me. For one bone, Figment has something called Charge Up. It lets you add one bone to your backup plan, and what you use are attack or defense dice from the supply. And it does matter which one you use, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. For two bones, you can do time blip, and that lets you increase or decrease the round counter by one. So you can use warp in your time skipper profession to mess with the rounds, but you can also use time blip in your backup plan. For three bones, you don't get anything, but that's okay because when you get to four, you can do fortunate discovery, and that allows you to acquire a consumable die of your choice. And as you might've noticed, Figment's consumables are great. For five bones, you get a super interesting ability called Be Kind, Rewind. And what it lets you do is roll all the dice in your backup plan, including all the ones spent to activate the plan, which would basically be all of them. And you also get to roll all bones that were rolled this turn during your roll and resolve phase. So you get to roll all your backup plan dice and all of the bones that you just rolled. So you roll all those dice for free and you get to treat the rolled results as dice rolled this turn. So when I said that it mattered whether you choose attack or defense dice to put into your backup plan from the supply, that is what I meant. So if you use charge up to add an attack die, when you use be kind rewind, you'll be able to roll a bunch of extra attack dice, which is really great. Alternatively, if you think you need more defense, that might be what you stock up on and then you roll it and you defend yourself. 
You may also recall that borrowed time allows you to put exhausted dice from the time skipper profession into the backup plan. It's kind of nice to have them there because, again, if you do something like Be Kind Rewind, then you get to roll those another time and get to enjoy their effects. So it's actually a fantastic backup plan skill. And then, of course, for six bones, you can upgrade to your innate plus one, which lets you manipulate not only your spot in the initiative meter, but also one other allies or baddies. So that is Figment's awesome backup plan. Let's just talk about his beginner build strat, and we'll draw this video to a close. So as usual, Chip Theory is going to give us beginner build strategy tips over here on the back of his reference sheet. So for stats, it's recommended that your first stat or two should go towards HP. Then Figment might need a dex if you have a skill or two already trained. Otherwise, go for defense for survivability and more ways to get bones for your all-important backup plan. In terms of skills, it's recommended that you start with a time skipper profession line uh, and then use those dice to manipulate initiative and round counters. And the other thing you should grab is phase ghost because whether you're playing solo or cooperatively, phase ghost is absolutely fantastic to use because again, it can take some serious heat off of you. So as the sheet indicates, it's a little easier to play figment co-op than it is to play him solo, but there are a lot of things he can do for a player in either setting and I hope that y'all try and enjoy him. I just think he's a fascinating gear lock to play. And once you start to figure out the advantages of manipulating time the way that only Figment can, uh, you're gonna have a really good time breaking the space time continuum. So perhaps you can play Figment and make it feel all the faster uh, between now and when my next gear lock guide comes out. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon. And until then, happy gaming.